the absence of light, the loss of direction, no frame of reference, the presence of fear and uncertainty, void. And then, a light. It starts as a flicker. It's not glaring for all to see, but it's a light nonetheless. Beautiful and mysterious, helping us to see, guiding us, warming us, comforting us. It is growing. It is shining brighter now. In one timeless moment, something of heaven is birthed through the tears of a teenage girl and the cry of a newborn baby king. All of heaven is perched at the edge of the sky, watching, waiting. God is sending the light of heaven into the dark of this world. To the young, to the old, to the weak, to the strong, to the lost, to the found. He is coming to us. He is walking with us. He is dying for us. He is living in us. Our unthinkable darkness is being shattered by unbearable light. And we gather to see, to view with fresh eyes again, the light that all the darkness in the world cannot ever extinguish. Jesus is the light of the world. Well, good morning to Pastor Mac and the Buford Road uh, campus folks, as well as those joining us online, and to Pastor John and our James River campus brothers and sisters in Christ. God is good, and all the time. Well, if you're glad Advent's here and you've had a great chance to already worship wherever you are, why don't you thank the Lord with some hand praise this morning? That great worship, I know, on both campuses. So, so very thankful for that. Well, Dr. Rob Boyd tells about a man whose name was Charlie Stink. You heard me correctly. Charlie Stink. Can you imagine what he had to put up with as a child just listening to all the jokes and all of those, you know, knocking him about his last name? And it didn't stop even when he became an adult. And often his friends would come around him and say, Charlie, what, what, what's wrong with you? Why don't you just get your name changed? And for years they asked him to do that. And finally one day he did. He went to the court, he petitioned to have his name changed. He saw his buddies the next day and he said, well, I did it. After everything y'all have been saying to me over all these years, I finally got my name changed. And they said, well, what did you change it to? He said, I changed it to George Stink. <laughs> he said, but for the life of me, I can't see where it's going to make any difference. Now, you and I hear that and we think, how, how could you miss the point? How dumb do you have to be to miss the point? Well, I say that to say this because here we are at the season of Advent once again. And if we aren't careful, we will miss the point completely. You see, it can be easy to miss the point if you think the whole point is about, you know, having the party for your, your friends or your coworkers, And it's about, you know, inviting everybody to eat, drink, and be merry. We can miss the point if it's make it just about decorating, uh, the, you know, the perfect tree or, or having the, the ideal gift to give to someone. We can miss the point if we, if we think in our mind that we somehow just want to create a, a Norman Rockwell image of the perfect family Christmas around the tree. Well, for sure, the marketplace sees it as an opportunity, uh, really, just to boost retail sales. That could be missing it just a bit. And then even as consumers, if we make it all about having the perfect plan to get into that store to miss the crowd and guess, get the best deals, the result is the same. We will end up missing 
the point of Advent. And if we're being honest, that's really dumb. When we do that, it's really dumb. And so I want us to encourage us this Advent season not to miss the point. And to do that, I want to invite you to join me as we go back actually 750 years before Jesus was in even born to a prophet named Isaiah. He was known as a prophet of both hope and of judgment. And Isaiah the prophet, much like other prophets, Isaiah was called to, to speak truth to the powers of his day. For, for some 40 years of his life, he really served as kind of secretary of state to the kings of Judah. So he had a lot of influence. He had a, a platform for a big voice. And much like the times that we're in today... If you looked historically at the times that Isaiah was living and breathing and working in that position, the political and social climate were in chaos. Sound familiar? So it may just be that the words he had for them really are words for us. And so over the next four weeks of our Advent celebration, we're going to be look at, going back to look at what Isaiah says about what it's going to be like when Jesus comes not only when he is born into this world, but when he comes again. So really what we want to talk about here is that on one hand we have the kingdom of God beginning with the birth of Jesus. And on the other hand, the kingdom of God being brought to fulfillment when Jesus returns. And so our Advent season this year will be a twofold kind of celebration. Looking at the words of Isaiah to consider the, the birth of Jesus and the celebration of what is to come. What is to come when Jesus returns, when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord? I want to read it to you for the, the, the last verse of, last couple of verses in chapter 2 out of where we're coming this morning. He's describing what's going to happen when Jesus comes. He will judge between the nations. He will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Here it is. Come, descendants of Jacob. Here's the challenge. Here's the word. Let us walk in the light of the Lord. Let us walk in the light of the world. I, Isaiah is introducing the truth here that as Jesus comes into our world, he's going to be bringing peace and lies. I'm going to talk about peace next week. But today I want us to focus on the light of the world in Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but I would say that we share this, that one of the things that is most mesmerizing at Christmas time for old and young alike are the lights. It's the lights on our Christmas tree, whether they're flashing or not. Let's do, let's do a quick uh, a poll. How many of you have your lights flashing on the tree at home, off and on, intermittent? Anybody? And then the others, of course, it's just steady. It doesn't matter. It's still about the lights and the, the, the gleam that they put in our eye, whether it's lights in the windows or lights on the, the porch with decorations. And, of course, you are well aware there are those who just go absolutely hog wild putting up lights and, and scenes of Christmas uh, covering every bit of the acreage of their yard. And when you drive by, they even provide a radio station, right? So you can listen to the music as the lights change. It's one of the exciting things that we do at Christmas time. And yet there's not a thing wrong with any of this as long as we understand. We can't miss the point. We cannot miss the point by what Isaiah said when he said, let us walk in the light. Now, this isn't, this isn't going to be new news to us because some 800 years from then, it would be the Apostle Paul who would say in Romans 13, verses 11 and 12, and do this understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer than you think, than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. Here it comes. So let us put aside our deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Same message. Same message as Isaiah had. As a prelude, Paul says, to putting on the armor of light, we are to first put aside our deeds of darkness. Well, when you go back to Isaiah, Isaiah would have agreed because his challenge was for us to walk in the light of the Lord. And then immediately following those first, that, that fifth verse, he launches into the three sins that the people of Judah were committing. So they're both on the same page here. He lists the three sins. And interestingly enough, they may have something to say about where we are today. The first one he talks about is that false worship had crept into their lives. 
Now, he would have been the first to have said that the people of, of Judah were still going to the temple. They were being very religious about keeping up with the rites and the celebrations in the temple. But they had also begun to include bits and pieces of other religions. In order to be, well, more accommodating, some might have said to be a little more tolerant towards others. So you, you might say they were worshiping false gods in the name of diversity because they were hoping to reach out to the non-Jews and include them. That can be dangerous. I, I, I really, I struggled with even telling you this story. It is true. Uh, but I'm embarrassed by it, not for myself, but for others. It was several years ago, several years ago during the Christmas season. I was doing an interim supply job. That means I was just preaching on Sunday morning. I would show up and they would give me a bulletin. And that's, I knew when I was to get up and preach and that's all they wanted me to do. And so they asked me to come and do a Christmas Eve meditation. They said it's one of our biggest services of the year. And so um, I, I arrived and sure enough, you could tell the anticipation and excitement was just crazy. It was standing room only. And I, I stood and I gave my meditation. It was earlier on in the service. And I, then I went and sat down on the front pew and I noticed that all of a sudden the anticipation and kind of tenseness in the room, excitement, just kind of geared up a whole nother notch. Now I thought, are they that glad I finished preaching or what's the deal here? But then the, 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 the organist began to play Away in the Manger. And I turned and I looked over my shoulder and I noticed that everybody was inching out to the edge of their pews and turning to look back at the entry doors to the church. Children were so excited they began to get up on the pew and first they were kneeling but then they were just standing. It was just straining to peer and to see what was going to happen. It was obvious this was the moment of buildup for this entire service. And the doors flew open and there stood Santa Claus holding a baby doll wrapped in claws. To the hymn, Away in a Manger, Santa Claus walks down and places baby Jesus in the manger and then sat down while the rest of the hymn was played. And I know they thought I was praying because I had my head down, my eyes closed, and all I could say was, Dear Jesus, come quickly. Dear Jesus, come quickly. Listen, you can't make this up. The people of Judah... What, what Isaiah was saying is, be careful. You, you don't want to water down the beliefs here. You, just to include the practices of the world around you to seem tolerant is not the way to show your loyalty and your love to God. He moved on then, and, and surprise, surprise, he also uh, said that you also are, are dealing with the sin of worshiping the God of materialism. That's right, materialism back in the days of Judah. It was a supremely a, 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 a prosperous time in the days of Judah. And the people started really kind of trusting in their own wealth and then their own security. Sound familiar? The quest to accumulate more and more never seemed to stop. As a matter of fact, God kind of became a, an afterthought. It was so bad, they never even kind of praised God and, and thanked God for the fact that it was He who had given them the ability to even amass this kind of wealth. Well, we understand this. We know the challenge of this. When, the, when, the, when our lives are driven by materialism and still trying to get more and more before we know it, God is not in first place. He's in second place. So we too can be guilty of this. But he goes on, there's a third sin that he lists, and he says, you've also been guilty of worshiping gods of your own making. Now, we could quickly go down the line of idols, and indeed, there were these little wooden carved things that they would keep in their house, and rather than making the, the long trek to the temple and keep the religious rites and the celebrations, they would just stay there in their own homes out of, with these little idols they had made and, and worship to them and, and pray to them. Well, the question is, what about us? We may not have wooden idols that we carve, but we worship false gods of our own making when I think when we try to take God's place. When all of a sudden we don't want to be the clay, we want to be the potter. And so we insert ourselves into God's position thinking that we know what is best for us. In essence, when we do that, we're making a God out of ourselves. Isaiah was describing for them, he's describing for us today, look, this is, that's darkness. All of that has to do with darkness because we understand darkness is that symbol of sin. Yes, literally, because so many sins are committed in the literal dark. But even more than that, there is this darkness in our heart that he may be talking about. 
that enables us to commit sins in broad daylight, really with everybody watching. Sometimes they're not, but even sometimes when they are watching. The thoughts we have, the feelings we may be harboring, even the actions that we do in secret. And so in reality of such darkness, this command from Isaiah on behalf of God, sent by God to reveal this truth to them, was for them is for us to walk in the light of the Lord. In Isaiah's words would continue to be echoed throughout the New Testament. Ephesians 5.8 describes, For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So walk as children of the light. Jesus even said it in John 8.12. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And then my favorite from 1 Peter 2.9. You're a chosen race, a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim why are we a people of the light? In order that we may proclaim the mighty acts of Him who called us out of darkness and into His marvelous light. The theme started 750 years before Jesus was even born. What is this light? It's pretty simple. But sometimes we can be so dumb, we miss it. When walking as children of the light means that we're well, we're different. We're different from the world because God is in us. When we walk as children of the light, that means we're, we're being these shining examples amongst the people around us. We, we are learning to walk in God's light. And as we do that, we are drawing others towards the light to come walk with us. We are to be the living Word of God, the living Word of God in the world because we understand people need that Word. At one time, we needed this word. And so God has chosen us to carry it into the world. So our language should be different. Our goals should be different. Our allegiance, our loyalty, our priority, not priorities, our priority should be different. Our actions are different because the light of the Lord is within us. And we are to reflect that light. You know, many Christmas lights that perhaps you have at home or others in the stores are intermittent. They flash on and off, plunging something into darkness and then all of a sudden lighting up. It makes for a beautiful, eye-catching display of beauty one moment and then darkness the next. But we cannot be seasonal, intermittent lights. We're not called to have an off-on switch so that when people are looking, turn it on quick. No. It's to remain on always. So the challenge from Isaiah and to us today, how are we doing walking as people in the light? Are we people of the light in the grocery store right now? Are we people of the light when we're on the highway? Are we people of the light when we're in an office hallway and people are stopping by and there are conversations going on? Are we people of the light in a restaurant when the service is awful? Are we people of the light when we've been on the phone on hold for 45 minutes? Our light is not to have an off-on switch. It's not to be intermittent. Because we were reminded here, we become the fulfillment of every resource that light offers. What is light? Light reveals in the darkness. Light brings life. Light brings warmth. Light provides guidance as a way to see. Light gives off a reflection. That's who we are called to be. There's a story about a Christmas pageant that I think brings all of this kind of uh, into focus. The day of the pageant had arrived and this uh, little girl named Jana was so very excited and her parents saw all the excitement in her. They didn't, they really didn't know what part she had, but the way Jana was, was kind of acting about it and so excited about it, they thought, well, surely she must have one of the main roles in the Christmas pageant story. 
And so they arrived uh, where this was going to be uh, done, and everyone was seated there in the pews just as the pageant began. And Jana's parents were sitting there, and they began to look around. And over on this side over here, they saw the, the shepherds kind of fidgeting, waiting for the pageant to begin. But it, and the way they had them placed, they figured, well, those are the shepherds out in the fields watching their flocks. And then they saw Mary and Joseph standing behind the, the manger scene, looking very solemn. And then over to the left-hand side were the three wise men waiting somewhat impatiently. But their daughter Jana was nowhere to be found in any of the scenes. And then all of a sudden the teacher began to read. A long time ago, Mary and Joseph had a baby and they named him Jesus. And when Jesus was born, a bright star appeared over the stable. Boom! Out jumps Jana from behind a, a, a darkness and a, and, a, and a blanket there holding the brightest, biggest tinfoil star you could ever imagine. And she ran with it over, stepping forward over to right over Mary and Joseph. And the the teacher began to talk about how then the, the, the shepherds looked up and saw the star and Jana started shaking it and wiggling it over there and the shepherds came over there and then she talked about how the wise men were coming to visit Jesus and how would they know where, to, where he was and she was just got the wise men there. And the play ended and they were on the way home and she said, Mom, Dad, did you see it? Did you see it? I had the main part. And their mom said, well, uh, you did? She said, yes. I had the main part because I showed everybody where to find Jesus. You and I have the main part this Advent with our life walking in the light to show people where to find Jesus. Today's a day of hope. I hope we don't miss the point. That would be so dumb. Pray with me. Father, into this moment, may your light shine. May we sense the presence of your Holy Spirit, creating in us perhaps that pneuma nudge, that message that you are speaking to each of us individually a message that has our name on it. And I pray in these moments that we might answer this question. What has God said to me in this hour of worship? Amen.